Uh, so, so uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of the seminar of the Center for Institutional Studies at the HSC University. <clears throat> we are quite pleased to have tonight as our speaker, Samitra Jha from uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business. Samitra, who is also known as Sound to his friends and colleagues, uh, has his degrees uh, in economics and math, interestingly enough, from various universities, including Stanford. He published profusely uh, top journals such as uh, uh, Econometric, a quarter of the Journal of Economics, uh, American Political Science Journal, <clears throat> in the American uh, American Political Science <coughs> Association. Uh, uh, in APSA, he published a paper that helped Timur Nadkov and myself in our work. It was about how combat experience in the Second World War has affected the uh, norms, values, and social capital of Indian soldiers who fought in the British Army. It's a great paper. And uh, from that time onwards, <coughs> Uh, so, uh, and myself and Timur are in contact with each other, and I'm very pleased that uh, some had agreed to, has agreed to present his paper on source and uh, bank shares, financial approach to mitigating political polarization and conflict. So, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. It's such a delight to be um, with you virtually. I was hoping to be in Moscow with you and Unfortunately, that might have to wait for a while. <laughs> um, um, so this is actually a book project I've been working on for since graduate school. So, um, so I, I, you know, I have a fairly ambitious um, set of things I want to talk about today, including summarizing a few papers as well as some kind of new, new work that we've been doing as well. And, and uh, please feel free to interrupt, um, you know, as, as, as I go along. Um, so. I, um, I'm actually British as well as um, American and I like to think Indian as well. And I was, happened to be in Jerusalem during the uh, Brexit referendum for reasons that will become clear in a moment. And frankly, I was a bit appalled. And, and I know this is a controversial thing to say and I know reasonable people can disagree on, on the Brexit referendum and, and what was the right decision there. But what I was, I think what I was most appalled about was the fact that I, I felt to some extent that my fellow citizens hadn't really thought thought it through and uh, weren't as informed as perhaps they could be on one of these really important issues of the day. And my 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 concern was even more um, exacerbated when it became clear the next day that the uh, the top trending the second most uh, top trending question on Google um, the day after the referendum in from the UK was what is the European Union? So. You know, the, um, this is, seems to be kind of a, a, a key problem more generally as you kind of think about the world and the way it is um, at the moment. Populism has been on the rise, as you know, and, and it's been associated with large increases in policy uncertainty and, 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 and on globally in the last five years or so. In fact, my colleague uh, Nick Bloom and co-workers, they've, um, you know, they've been tracking the words uncertainty and risk in, in varieties of newspapers. And you can see that we're sort of at a very at a remarkable height, even kind of in historical perspective in terms of the policy risks and uncertainty that people perceive um, around the world. At the same time, you know, I'm, I'm a development economist as, as, some, as a number of you are. And you know, one thing that you know, has become clear is that many developing countries still face a, a serious concern about civil conflict and, and political conflict within, within them. The problem of violence has not necessarily been solved in, in, in achieving sort of political decision making. And so, the, you know, of course, you can see that the, it did go down after, after the, the, the Cold War, um, but it's, it's sort of been coming up again um, since then. And so with all this our, um, political uncertainty and policy uncertainty, it becomes even more important to be able to figure out how to manage risks as citizens and to understand and comprehend these risks. But basic financial literacy is, um, and a kind of a fine understanding of finance is actually has been lagging in both rich um, and, and poor countries. And, and women in particular have tended to lag behind. So um, in this literature, there are sort of three questions which, um, you know, they, 
people often call the big three questions. And I'll just give you a chance to read them. These are not challenging questions. Um, so th these, are, these are not difficult questions, but as you can see, um, you know, th through, in, in many rich countries, the, the number of people, both adults who are able to answer these questions is, um, are, is actually fairly low. And for women in particular, in the United States, for example, 22.5% um, of women were able to answer all of these questions and, and only 38.3% of men. This, this pattern, this gender gap in financial literacy is actually fairly, fairly common around the world. And, and it's, it's remarkably remarkable how low it is, even for basic numeracy questions, as well as compound interest and the understanding of risk diversification um, and, and how that applies to the financial markets. So there's sort of, I think, two key questions that um, I've been trying to focus on, which are for global development. One is, can we in design interventions that can empower citizens in both rich and poor countries, equipping them with the tools to mitigate, help mitigate the risks of the modern economy, and by empowering them, could we potentially auto -mit also mitigate political polarization and violent conflict? And further, what can theory and history uh, tell us about these things? So I think, you know, I've been looking at this, kind of this problem of how to reduce political conflict and violence in a number of different ways. Um, so one way I've been looking at is how inter-ethnic or inter-group business relationships can mitigate conflict. And so this is sort of part of my early research. I've looked at, I've also been doing a book project on no, how nonviolent civil disobedience can be a peaceful way to achieve um, political change and why it often fails, despite the promise that many people thought it would have in the 20th century, including, of course, Martin Luther King and, and Mahatma Gandhi. But um, one, I think one avenue that's particularly fruitful is, is finance as well. And, you, and, and finance, I think, is particularly valuable precisely because on, it's really about sharing the future. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to develop contingent cred and credible claims that can allow people to, to benefit in, together from, from, from the future. And in fact, if you kind of take you know, Mark, uh, you know, the benchmark Markowitz model seriously, in the absence of transaction costs, both elites and non-elites should be all able to hold the same market portfolio of risky assets. And this should align their incentives. So, you know, whether it be me or or Donald Trump, we, we, we should in principle hold the same market portfolio of risky assets. Um, of course, he'll have a, well, it depends, you know, he, he only pays, he pays less than me in taxes, as, uh, but, um, but in principle, he should be paying, you know, he should have a, a larger portfolio than me, but in the same proportions um, assigned to the market portfolio. And so this should align incentives towards socially beneficial outcomes, or at least those that benefit the market portfolio. Now, Oftentimes when we think about the market portfolio, we only think about the stock market, but you can think about it much more broadly to think about the kind of the risky things that we are endowed with, including things like ethnicity. So, um, but before I get to that, let me just show you um, some, you know, basic patterns that we've been collecting. So, you know, there's, there's always a debate, um, you know, you'll often see, uh, you know, you're, you know, we're all economists in the room, we often see these d debates in the media, you know, stock market is booming while unemployment is is rising. You know, there's this battle being Main Street and Wall Street, and, and, and a lot of things are pitched in that direction. But, you know, the truth is, uh, and this will be no surprise, um, there is this positive correlation between the GDP of a country and, and its stock market performance in, in, in long, long term perspective. Now, um, this is true for the US. It's true for the OECD in general. The correlations are around 0.259 um, for the US, 0.193. Um, I, I generated this figure for Russia in the period from 1996 um, um, onwards, and the relationship is weaker. Um, so I, I, one thing I want to ask you about, uh, perhaps after, uh, after, the, um, after the talk. But um, the, other, the other part of this is, you know, um, the unemployment, as you know, will kind of, you know, is part of, part of the Federal Reserve Bank response or central bank response more generally will be to stimulate the economy in times of high unemployment. And this will tend to, by reducing interest rates, will also tend to stimulate the stock market. So even controlling for the federal, mar uh, you know, for the central bank response 
you still find a, a positive effect on, on you know, a, a strong a positive relationship between um, GDP and, and the stock market, you also find a negative and a robust co uh, difference between unemployment and, and the stock market. So this kind of, the story about unemployment and stock markets being kind of going in different direction um, is, is you know, the stock market doing well when unemployment is high isn't true on average. Uh, and I, I don't think we, we often <laughs> focus on that part of things. Um, I think more importantly, you know, the stock market only covers a small group, small segment of, 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 the, of the market and of the economy. And so, you know, as I was mentioning, you know, one thing that's, you know, that people often point out is, well, human capital is not, is not tradable, it's not insurable mostly, and neither is ethnicity. So if you're talking about ethnic conflict, how can you share the future when, when you can't share the um, being, I, I can't, for example, trade being brown with somebody. But I, but I, as I'm going to provide examples, um, political economy problem solvers from the past have actually, if not, they haven't sold being eth sold ethnicity per se, but they sold the risks associated with ethnicity, and they've done so through financial means. Similarly, um, people have sold the risks of human capital, which is often seen as not insurable, even though they can't sell the underlying human capital itself. So, so in in many ways, we I think we can't even for things we often even for asset classes we often think of as uninsurable like human capital and ethnicity you can do things you can develop new assets and innovations in the stock in the financial markets which can allow you to trade the risks associated with them. Um, another thing that i think is important is you know at least in the united states there's um, been a decline in the stock market um, in terms of its coverage so the number of listed firms in the united states has gone from three um to, from 7.3, uh, so, so 7,300 firms in 1996 to around 3,600 firms. There's been remarkable market concentration in, in this period of time. And you know, we can talk about some reasons for that as well. Um, one, one last set of qualms before I, um, you know, there's also, you know, of course with COVID, there's been a discussion, at least in this country, about whether, you know, the economy needs to be saved versus lives. And so is there a distinction between the two? And, uh, you know, I, I think especially, you know, we, as you know, we have an election in, in the next few weeks. There has been sort of an attempt to politicize this question and say, well, and separate the economy and lives. But I think, you know, I, I'm just going to sort of say, well, it, you know, in, in my view, it's, you know, it's, it's not really a compromise at all. It's just basically in order to save the economy, you need to sort of deal with the, crisis, the pandemic first. And so it's like a, it's, it's sort of a, but, but, you know, people, people have different views on this issue. All right. um, any any questions on that uh, before we go? Go on. Okay. Um, so the project, as I mentioned, this is sort of a um, is a book project. I'm hoping to finish this year, um, and it begins by um, you know begins with this sort of benchmark of of Markowitz and 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 you know this idea that by holding we should the more we we should be holding similar market portfolios. But then it kind of begins to look at uh, historical examples and natural experiments in history, and in particular focuses on three revolutionary states uh, where financial innovations were, were key to solving political problems. And, and these three revolutionary states actually subsequently led the world in GDP growth. And these include the UK in the 17th century during the sort of civil war and the glorious revolution, uh, the United States in the 18th century, and Japan in the 19th century. Um, so this is sort of work I've been doing over uh, uh, several years. Uh, then um, what I'm going to talk about a bit more today is about the field experiments we did, um, you know, looking to see whether we can apply some of these ideas in contemporary contexts using, um, using sort of experimental methodology. So I'll talk a bit about a field experiment we did in Israel where we um, um, randomly assign people the opportunity to trade shares and looking at effects both in their attitudes towards the peace process and their voting decisions, but also on the extent to which it um, empowers people in terms of increasing their financial literacy, their financial knowledge, their investment behavior, changing their investment behavior. I'll also talk a bit about the Brexit referendum um, study that we did and we're still working on. <laughs> Hopefully we'll finish it before Britain, uh, Britain's, you know, Britain actually has dealt with its uh, you know, has resolved its trade questions in, in as hopefully it will do by December. Um, 
Then, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about other ideas and alternative approaches. We actually have a conflict and polarization lab at Stanford, and we're trying to figure out how best to solve some of these problems, which I think are some of the most grave that we, we face at the moment, um, at least in this country. Um, so, um, so this idea that you can use shareholding to mitigate approaches to mitigate conflict has sort of been around for a while, but it's, it's um, and I, I think in particular, it's sort of good to highlight, I think, two more recent examples before we delve deeper into history. And one of them is Malaysia in 1969. So as you, as you know, Malaysia in 1969 faced a lot of ethnic rise, um, facing, uh, focused on, on the, mostly on the ethnic Chinese population who have tended to have sort of disproportionate roles in the commercial activity in the um, international trade of Malaysia. Um, so uh, after these ethnic rights, the, Chinese, uh, the Malaysian government um, established what's called the new economic policy. Um, and, and in that, they did a number of reforms. And one of them was that from now on, 30% of ethnic Chinese profits would go into a trust and that be redistributed to the Bhumi Putra population, which literally means the sons of the soil. And, so this is basically a shareholding kind of approach in some ways. Um, another approach, which many of you are familiar with, is in South Africa, has been adopted in South Africa since 2001. And this is part of a broader set of black ec ec um, economic empowerment policies where 20%, um, if you have 20% black ownership, uh, this will give you advantages in procurement and other, um, other opportunities before the government of South Africa, which of course is a large part of the economy. And, so what I think one difference between the two approaches is, whereas in Malaysia, the, the trust distribution has been fairly equitable, so many would argue, relatively speaking. In South Africa, um, basically what has tended to happen is you get the same set of people, often fairly politically well collected, on, on almost every board. So, you know, similar, similar uh, Ramaphosa, who of course is now the president of South Africa, he, he of course had strong ties to the ANC before that with the labor unions as well. And he found himself on pretty much uh, on, on most of the major boards of South African companies and became one of the richest um, men in, in Africa. And, and, and he did this entirely legally. And so, you know, so, it, but, but this was part of the kind of incentive structure that was created. Um, in, I, I went to Namibia a few years ago, and, and they were considering doing a similar policy there under what's called the New Equitable Economic Empowerment Framework. And so, um, what, you know, again, Namibia, I think, is a fairly remarkable country that has sort of faced much warfare in its history, but it's been able to sort of develop a fairly effective um, state. Uh, but they were still facing this problem to historic injustice and, and, um, and, and how to deal with the, the kind of the, the challenges of, of, of disproportionate um, ownership and, and other things which were born from all this warfare and, and um, colonialism in the past. Um, I also want to kind of point out another thing. So it's hard to, of course, with n equals two or n equals three, you know, you can do a before and after comparison, but it's really hard to sort of measure the effects of these types of approaches, um, one. And, and two, it's also in some ways, it's reinforcing ethnic division. So it's creating an ethnic tax. And so, you know, you, you know the ethnic Chinese today, you know, they, they might reasonably feel resentful, some of them, if, you know, for paying a tax just on the basis of what their ethnicity is. And, and this might not reduce the, the, the kind of divisions between, between communities, because in some sense it reinforces it and makes, recognizes these divisions in the eyes of the state. Um, I want to give one alternative, and so you know, in fact, from from Meiji Japan, which has a different, a very different flavor, and I think perhaps something we can learn from. Um, so, Meiji Japan in 1868, Japan in 1868 was um, had a you know, I think um, being from of Indian origin is is particularly fascinating for me because you know it had a, a samurai caste, which is what we're on 1.8. A million people, around 5% of the population. Um, they had a more entrenched caste system than India does. They, it was basically, you know, it was enforced by the state. You had a samurai had two swords and, and they could literally, uh, they had a monopoly over the right to bear arms and over administrative positions. You had a merchant class, you had an untouchable class, which was doing what was considered unclean professions. And, and, and those distinctions were recognized and reinforced by the state. And a samurai could literally execute you for disrespecting them 
um, if, if you disrespected them. Of course, this didn't happen a lot along the equilibrium path. People kind of understood that you know, this was not a good idea to disrespect a samurai, but in, in principle, it was, it was something they could do, right? So, um, so these guys have been at peace for since 1600, since the Battle of uh, Sekigahara. And so, but they, uh, you know, so, but, but they had remilitarized after the black ships of the U.S. Navy had kind of forcibly reopened Japan um, in, in the late uh, 19th century. And so, um, so they fought a war, a fairly kind of vicious, uh, vicious civil war, the Boshin War, and, and to kind of restore the emperor's authority um, in Japan. But they were also, the Japanese reformers realized that they were kind of, had fallen behind the technological frontier and they needed to, needed to develop quickly. The samurai themselves were the biggest potential losers to these reforms. They, you know, there's a re this guy, he looks unhappy and he, there's a reason, reason why he might be unhappy. So, you know, um, they introduced conscription. They, they banned, you know, they, they, they removed his, his monopoly of the right to bear arms. They, every samurai had a surname um, and only the samurai had surnames. Now everybody has a surname. So even like the emotive things, you know, forms of dress were banned, like the, the top knot. Things that, you know, the people kind of really put a lot of value in in terms of their identity were being removed um, in, in, in the name of sort of modernization and reforms. And so you can imagine why um, there might be some, some reason for resentment. And, 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 you know, again, sort of in the kind of classic Jim Fearon style game theory um, of conflict, you know, you could imagine that the conflict, there, is, there, are, there are good grounds for potential conflict because the samurai are strong, relatively strong today, but expect to be weaker in a future situation if they do not fight today. And so, in fact, there were civil wars in Japan, including the Satsuma Rebellion, which, um, which you know, absorbed uh, a large proportion of the, the state's um, budget in order to put down. Um, which, and, and this is a um, rebellion they made a movie about of starring Tom Cruise, though he didn't play a prominent role in the actual events. Um, Japan itself was one of the most fractured uh, polities in the world um, at, in the 18, 1860s. They, every domain had its own daimyo or ruler, and you, you, the, you, the clan was much stronger than, than the state in many ways, and you owed your allegiance to the clan rather than to others. Yet, I think it's fairly remarkable that Japan you know, succeeds in, in rapid modernization and centralization within a generation. And, and in fact, you know, it also, you think about Japan today, it's not a caste-ridden society by any means as well. And so I think for, again, coming from an Indian background, I think this is incredibly fascinating. So it, what it seems to what seems to have happened was um, that while they were doing these reforms, the the, um, the 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 government of Japan, many of them who are themselves samurai, basically, while they're um, kind of removing all the privileges of the samurai, they also are give, they also took their traditional rice obligations. So every Japanese samurai was had a, had a number, a koku rating, which is how many bushels of rice they were entitled to. So. Lots of bushels is a kind of a good thing, but many of them didn't have many like that. A, a, a koku uh, uh, is literally how much rice it requires a, a man to survive for a year. Um, so you'd have a number of koku, and if you had a number of koku, then you could support others and have retainers and so on and so forth. Right? So they took their traditional rice obligations, which all of them were old because they were kind of retainers, they were bureaucrats, they were soldiers, and instead they gave them bonds. They, they gave them government of Japan bonds, and they and they further allowed them to take these bonds and capitalize banks. So um, it was a you had to in order to create a national a new national bank you had to um, you you had to capitalize it with eighty percent government bonds in other words samurai bonds, and twenty percent gold or silver um, often from the non samurai from the merchants um, largely speaking. And what, what this did was it, it created a dramatic expansion of bank branches in Japan. They went from seven to 150 in, in only a two year period. So much expanded so fast, the government said, okay, we need to slow this down. It's gonna create inflation, right? So um, I, I, um, I might not go into this in the interest of time, but it's, it's actually the model and the numbers that they use are actually mimic Alexander Hamilton's reforms in the 1790s in, in, in many ways. So in the creation of the first bank of the United States, you needed to, um, in order to invest, you needed 20, um, 80 percent government bonds and 20 percent gold and silver. Similarly, and it was again the, this was done. Um, the bonds came from the assumption of state debts, 
owed to Revolutionary War veterans. So again, Hamilton was trying to solve this problem of the veterans and the soldiers as well. Um, these are also cross-ethnic institutions. So in 1878, you know, you had around 30,000 ex samurai nobles, which controlled around 30.5 million yen in bank stock, and, and the rest were held by commoners. But these numbers actually persisted over time. They continued to have samurai, non-samurai working together in these banks. Mostly the merchants were the ones who ran the banks, but the samurai owned the banks or, or, or large shares in the banks, right? So what seems to have happened is, you know, there was, you know, firstly, the violent samurai protests seemed to end ended, and instead the samurai, ex-samurai, began to push first for ex-samurai rights, which are called Shizoku Minken, um, but then they, this expanded to being a, a push for constitutional rights, um, so the Jiyo Minken Undo, which um, actually became a major force in, which created the first Meiji constitution in Japan. Um, of course, the first Meiji constitution, not the best of all constitutions, but definitely more constitutional than what they had before, right? So um, also you had a cultural shift. And, and now this, you know, this is um, Shibusawa Eiichi, who is the, he is often called the father of Japanese capitalism. He's the founder of the Daiichi Bank, um, which literally means the first bank. Um, this is Shibusawa Aichi in 1876, so before the reforms. And he's, you know, he's a samurai, he's got his two swords. And this is him in 1877. He's a banker. You know, he's got his top hat. He's got the, the walking stick. Uh, admittedly, I mean, this overstates it a bit because he's in Paris during this picture. But, you know, there was a kind of a, a dramatic cultural change, even while they were sort of changing the incentives and the alignment of the samurai towards, um, towards banking rather than towards being fighters. And so, um, so this is actually what gives the name to the paper in the book project, the swords into bank shares. They take, and, you know, they take this potential you know, ethnic, ethnic obligation they owe to a certain caste and they give them and said bank, a monopoly bank, financial asset, which allows them to monetize and, and, and have a, a credible stream of payments um, from, from banking. So instead of being potential war, you know, warriors fighting for their rights, they, they decided they instead became, you know, local investors in the local silk merchants and the local cotton merchants and so on and so forth. And they had a credible gain from, from, from peace, right? So, um, it also seems to have undermined ethnic divisions. So, you know, you don't think of, again, you know, the Japanese, they're abolishing the kind of rights of samurai that make them special and distinctive while giving them this financial monopoly, right? Which, which of course, over time becomes, you know, it's, you know finan financial assets don't really have a, have a cultural identity, <laughs> let's, let's say, right? Um, so, so it doesn't really reinforce the kind of the differences as we were talking about in Malaysia. Um, and in South Africa. And, you know, so I, I studied this in 17th century England as well, and, you know, where, where the introduction, looking at the introduction of joint stock companies um, and how that um, creates a new coalition in favor of support for representative government in England. And, and you know, I think you, see, you sort of see similar cultural patterns there. So, you know, in, in the 19th century, Napoleon calls England, you know, famously a nation of shopkeepers. And, you know, he's doing this kind of, you know, as an insult, but in some ways there's some truth to this, right? Because English, the kind of the asset classes held by the, the English elites were not very, very strongly land versus, versus city versus, you know, mer people would move in between these asset classes in such a way that they, um, they tended to have fairly aligned, um, you know, uh, portfolios, and even though there was, of course, a lot of disagreement about, like, about policy, they, they, they wouldn't kill each other, um, importantly. So after, after um, essentially after 1648, after the civil, English Civil War, there was no major political, violent political conflict in England. I mean, you can think about the 1745 rebellion under Bonnie Prince Charlie, you can think about the Glorious Revolution. None of these actually had major support within England. Um, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was a way of accommodating new groups as well as the make, build, building broad support through the financial markets, which kind of created a commonality in terms of national interest as well. Um, so, so this is the kind of the, the book project. So it's to kind of think about theory and empiric, what theory, economic theory can tell us, as well as natural experiments from history, which can help us document how financial innovations how, how, uh, which have allowed the risk and return to things like human capital in the case of merchants in England in 17th century, or ethnicities like, such as that of the samurai 
in the 19th century to be shared and, and in such a way which have aligned, in the, aligned broader groups in favor of peace and border reform. So in Japan, it was the, it was the bonds and, and, the, and the national bank reforms. In England, it was the creation of joint stock companies. In the US, it was a similar kind of model to the Japanese in many ways. It was a creation of, of what, what Thomas Jefferson would kind of call a speculating phalanx of, of people who were basically created financial persistence, even while they were creating the financial system in the US, created political persistence, which meant that the financial reforms of Alexander Hamilton never actually got turned back. It's also inspired by by, by the Russian example as well. So, I mean, I, I, I'm going to defer to, you know, I, I think the collective knowledge about that is much greater in this room than, um, than, than, um, than many of my audiences. But as you know, um, you know, the, uh, part of the idea behind voucher privatization in the 1990s was also to kind of create a kind of an ownership society um, and, and while privatizing in such a way that would kind of create um, a strong cons political constituency in favor of, sort of um, secure property rights. And so I think what was interesting about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to hear what your thoughts are about, about these reforms. My, my, um, they, they, it actually kind of, yeah, and not only Chubais's reforms and that of others, I think were, were really informative in many ways. And I think one thing that we, we took, I took out from the Russian example was, um, you know, the, the fact that the vouchers were given for free to many people and, 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 and basically, you know, you could use them to buy stock in, in, the, in, 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 in the state enterprises, right? So, but many people didn't know the value of these, these, these enterprises and they didn't know which ones to buy. And so the, if you knew, you know, you know, then you could really kind of buy them for Copex on the ruble from those who didn't know the value of these, these things. And, and you got an incredible concentration of wealth, obviously. In, in Russia from the people who really knew the value of, of, of these enterprises. And so part of what we, we wanted to do in our study, which I'll, I'll show you as part of, by design, is make sure that people can understood the potential revenue streams that come from holding assets. And so we, we'd reduce their ability to divide, divest um, and, and, and help them kind of learn the value of, of, of being invested in, in, in some way. So I'll come to that design element there, but it's directly kind of, influenced by the by the Russian example um, in many ways. So um, uh, any, any questions, thoughts, comments, remarks, haiku? Um. Well, I kind of wanted to go into this Chubais yeah. thing, like the way he did it was completely opposite from the way of equality when giving everybody access to the same information and the same resources and to yeah. get like completely opposite result of non-stop war in Chechnya, in Ossetia, in Ukraine, in Syria, like pretty much every year there was war somewhere. <laughs> it's, as opposed to, you know, having more peace, he's got wars all over the place. So I, I'm not sure it should be the same line. It should be like, you know, facing the different direction or something. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I guess the question is, you know, um, about intent as well, you know, so one would say that, you know, some people would say that, you know, uh, um, Japan's rise in the 19th century was a mixed blessing and blessing in many ways that, you know, they, they solved the internal political economy problem, but then, you know, a, a lot of countries ended up getting invaded <laughs> subsequently too, right? And, and similarly, um, you know, the United States solved its political economy problem for a while. Um, you know, um, until the you know, first century almost. But, but then, you know, on the frontiers of the United States, a lot of communities didn't do quite so well in terms of those who were not part of that, <laughs> that arrangement. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, um, I, th I think one question is what, you know, which I would be really fascinated to know your views on is what could he have done differently? And could he, have, for example, um, you know, could he have, brought in some of these groups that you said kind of became part of the, you know, be, became engaged in conflict afterwards and, and so on and so forth. Was there a way of using this opportunity of privatization to, to, to kind of reduce that? And, and I, I think one way, of course, would be is this learning channel that I'm going to emphasize, but I, I think that there, I, I'd love to know your thoughts because I think it's... You, you, know, you, you know what you want to look at? You want to look at the Northern Irish conflict like the general that Ireland of 
you know, people who came in in 1600s and the locals. Uh, fundamentally, they had a very big difference in ownership because when you're a Catholic family of 20 children, no way you can own a house. And if you are a Protestant, you actually can afford to own a house. And since voting only works for those who are house owners, very frequently they were misaligned and very frequently there were bloody riots all over the place. So, I mean, if you, if you want more examples, I would take a look at that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think another, I think a counter example of that, maybe, maybe we can talk about in the Q&A is, is Scotland. Um, but, you know, which has, of course, the, 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 the religious divide that you're talking about, but doesn't have this, this feature. And it has it, and, and in part, they, they did use the financial system, arguably, to, to solve this problem. But, um, but I'd love to come back to this um, at the end. But it's, it's, a, it's a great point that the Irish-Scottish distinction is, is a useful one. Um, any more thoughts? Or? I, I, have, I have a small question. Do you have uh, any measures of concentration of wealth after these reforms in Japan or in the, in the United States? Mm -hmm. Just uh, so if you really want to compare it with, say, with the Russian case, it yeah. might be useful just to come, uh, just to have those measures that might be a, sort of a hint of why these reforms uh, resulted in so different, uh, mm -hmm. in so different outcomes. I think we can. You can get yeah. For for Japan, we have some information from 1868, which um, oh, so, sorry, from 1880, um, which which will give us some some post ex post information. Um, not at the individual level, but it'll be sort of more at the kind of who how many people own you know <laughs> so this versus that and kind of at the at the county level. And there are you know four four thousand counties um, roughly. And then in the United States. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, that should be doable too, but it's a, it's a great point. Um, is there equivalent information for Russia? Yeah, there are several papers. I think the last paper of PKT and his team, mm -hmm. they have a paper on uh, wealth concentration in Russia for a long period of time. Well, they argue that uh, wealth inequality in Russia is the highest in the world. Yeah, today. Number one, number one, wealth, not income, wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, largely an outcome of the privatization. It's a great mm -hmm. point. So my, I have something to say, but maybe we should let you talk and then at the end of your presentation, get back to that issue, because it's very important for what is happening in Russia and with Russia. All right, thanks. So, all right, so I, I, shall, I shall speed through what I'm going to say so we can <laughs> talk about these things. Um, right. So um, I have I have till how much more time? Sorry. Well, uh, uh, how much more, how much time you need? Let's let's start with this. Let it be a, a part in part um, supply I, driven. <laughs> tell me Indogenous. tell me when I should go okay. Uh, if you can stay within twenty minutes, that will still allow us meaningful time for right. some discussion. Okay. okay? I, I hate I hate to restrict you, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I want I want to hear, so I want to listen. So all right, okay. I, I, I just have a bunch of boring regressions to see. You know, you guys don't really see those, right? So, um, um, no, I, I, I'll, I'll be quick. So, um, so one question, though, of course, you know, you, you go to the you go to a policymaker and you say, well, you know, this is what happened in Meiji, Japan. You know, I actually, I did say this to the senior advisor to the president of Namibia. <laughs> this is what happened in Meiji, Japan. Maybe you should think about a different strategy. They kind of roll their eyes and say, well, you know, Meiji, Japan, 19th century, who cares, right? So, so, so we, you know, one, one natural question is, you know, can this work in a contemporary setting? Um, and, and even one where, you know, even a really difficult and challenging environment where people are really kind of, um, uh, where, where the problem has, has existed for quite some time, right? So, so um, we, you know, so this is joint work with Moshe Shayo. Um, this is a paper we actually uh, published last year. Um, is um, we, we looked at um, whether we could do, the, uh, whether we could, financial approaches could mitigate conflict even in, in an environment like, like that of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And so um, just very quickly, you know, this is, doesn't need any introduction to anyone here for the kind of gravity of the problem it faces, causes the people in the region and, and, and the populations there, but also broadly in its geopolitical consequences. Um, it's been going on for, you know, for well on 60, uh, 70 years now. And, and, and um, 
and people think it's incre increasingly attractive. <laughs> But the potential gains from peace are, 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 are high. So the RAND Corporation, which is based in Santa Monica, California, and is a nonpartisan um, independent organization, they estimate the, a two-state solution, which in their view is still the most likely to succeed, would, um, would um, give is, increase Israeli GDP by $123 billion over a 10-year period, increase Palestinian GDP by $50 billion. In, in, uh, a return to widespread conflict, however, would cost Israeli GDP around $250 billion over the same period and Palestinian GDP around $46 billion. So these are large numbers. And I think a natural question that economists can, can raise is, you know, why aren't, we get, why aren't we getting this cozy and bargain going, right? So, you know, why can't, why can't, we, gain, why can't we make the deal? Um, of course, um, you know, maybe Jared Kushner has already solved this problem while I was speaking about, um, but um, you know, it remains a, a challenging one. And, and political economists, uh, you know, like many of you in the room, know that there are many reasons why the deal is hard to reach. But I want to emphasize two in particular. One is that the conflict is costly, but making concessions for peace is also perceived as highly risky. And so, for example, when, um, when I met Bibi Netanyahu, who uh, I believe is still the prime minister, it's always kind of unclear, but he, he is he a is. survivor. Right. Um, <laughs> no, either. Uh, uh, he, yeah, every, um, so he, uh, he, po he, he pointed out of his office window in, in the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem and said, um, the, the West Bank is there, uh, or the, uh, basically the Palestinian ter territories are there. And his point was that Israel really lacks strategic depth. And if they were to withdraw from the West Bank as part of a two-state solution, it might lead to a kind of a, a power vacuum as, as happened when there was a withdrawal from Gaza. And this might lead to a deteriorate, uh, might lead to Hamas or another group to move in, and this would lead to a deterioration of Israel's subsequent security situation. Um, the, uh, um, the, but so, so there's a view that if you make, make, make a concession for peace today, it's, as, it's also very risky, and that's the view of the center right. The view of the center left is that um, the, you know, the status quo policies are also incredibly risky, both for Israel's dem um, dem democracy and its security situation. And so you know, it, it makes sense to try and still make um, concessions for peace. Um, another aspect of it is that people have very different personal exposure to risks and, 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 to, uh, and to the risks of the conflict. So if you're, you know, people see stuff on television um, and, and geographically there are differences as well. So if you're in the rocket range from, from Gaza, you might have a very different perception of, of, of the conflict um, than someone who lives in Tel Aviv, which tends to be fairly insulated, and someone who lives in Jerusalem where there's always some something happening in terms of these types of issues, right? So um, people might not internalize the economic costs or gains faced by the country or the region in general because they're focused on the kind of the, the emotive aspects or the personal aspects. So, so we asked, well, could exposure to financial markets, which, which can help people learn and internalize the economic costs of conflict and internalize not just in the monetary sense, but also kind of in the kind of psychological sense of thinking about the broader picture could this change the individual's attitude towards war and peace and even their voting decisions? And could this happen even in a well-trodden environment, you know, persistent ethnic conflict like Israel? Where people, you know, this is not something that people don't have in their mind. People are often thinking about it, right? So, and, and we found that the answer appears to be yes. So we, um, what we did was quickly is we randomly assigned financial assets um, to um, a set of likely voters uh, and we each got one specific financial asset and they got incentives to trade that asset over a period of four to six weeks. Um, and, and some of them got Israeli assets, some got Palestinian assets, some of them got a voucher which they could use to buy the Tel Aviv 25 index and others, there's a control group. Uh, is, is Excuse me. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so the outcomes were the attitudes and on, on the, the ad, both their attitudes towards the peace process and how this was affected in their voting decision in the 2015 general elections. Um, so what we found was exposure to incentives to trade in the financial markets increased the likelihood of voting for left parties, which in Israel are large, were largely those which were pro-peace initiative by around 46 percentage points. Um, and it similarly reduced the probability of voting for the right parties by around a similar, um, a similar, um, similar vote share. The, the exposure also increased the willingness to support the making concessions for peace and, and reduce opposition to specific costly concessions. And the effects persisted even and even accumulated, arguably, one year after the study. And what we found, what we, uh, we did a, a bunch of things to kind of get at the mechanism. 
I'll, I'll speed through this because the paper's already published. But what we found, we argue is that it's really consistent with human capital formation. People learn both about financial markets and through that, they learned about the economic costs of the conflict. So, um, you know, in, in particular, people, you know, we asked them a question is, in the event of a two-state solution, would you, how would you expect um, your personal security to change? How would you expect your, uh, your economic situation to change? How would you expect Israel's economic situation to change? And how would you expect Israel's security to change? And really what seemed to drive the result on, on, on the voting decision was people began to perceive increased gains to Israel's economy from, from peace, from, 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 the, from a two-state solution. And in particular, this effect was strongest for the risk averse. So you could think about two ways this might happen. One is that they thought that the peace process, peace concessions were less risky, or they thought that the status quo was more risky than they perceived before. Because the risk averse are responding more, it seems consistent with the idea that people began to be aware that their, the risks to Israel were higher under the status quo than they kind of perceived um, before, before the study. Um, so um, in, in our follow-up paper, which is not published, so, we're, um, so we particularly appreciate your feedback, we found that this was a very, this is also a very empowering intervention. So exposures to trade in financial markets increased the financial confidence and reduced the gender gap between men and women in these issues. The thing, you know, the motivating question that we talked about at the beginning. And it does do, it, this is in four ways both increases people's objective financial literacy, including on the, the big three questions that I, I mentioned before. It makes people more confident in their existing financial knowledge. So, um, um, you know, so we, uh, we, in terms of their self-assessments of their financial knowledge, if, if, if actually women become more, more confident, men have become, men if anything become slightly less confident, and I'll show you the patterns there. Um, it increases, um, to some extent, increases people's risk tolerance. Um, and it also changes their investment behavior, their willingness to participate and invest in the stock market after the study. So just to give you kind of a, a flavor of this, before the treatment, 26% um, of women and around 47% of men in our kind of, um, in our sample had claimed that they invested in stocks, some form of stocks within six months before the study. After the treatment, um, this number got to around 41% of women and 48% of men. So really the, the gender gap between men and women in, in financial participation um, changed, um, changed quite markedly. Furthermore, men and women become more self-reliant in their decisions. And this is important particularly because there's a literature in finance which shows that women get inferior advice from financial advisors um, on, on, on what to invest in. And so these, so we found that men and women both become more able, more confident in their own ability to invest and, and do so um, without asking others so much. Um, before. We also find that different types of stock exposure could teach different things. So, for example, being exposed to Arab stocks um, seems to have mitigated what potential home biases. People became more willing to invest overseas afterwards. Being uh, exposed to index funds made people more um, aware of the not relative riskiness of index funds versus, versus stocks as well. Um, so this, is, this, um, this study was the first to randomly assign people financial assets to give them incentives to trade those assets and study their effects on both political behavior and on financial confidence and literacy. And there's a bunch of literatures that this has a connection with, which I won't go into, but I'm happy to talk about um, afterwards if, if anyone's interested. Um, so the design was, um, yeah, uh, it was a, we, we, the sample was drawn from a, a, a nationally representative um, internet panel, around 60,000 people participate in the panel. Um, it's not a, there's not a lot of super rich in there. So, you know, Bill Gates does not answer survey questions on, on the internet for money. Um, at least I don't think he does. He's a kind of, but, but, um, but, you know, the effects were quite similar if you're rich or poor and, and do not seem to be sensible, sensitive to those things. They're invited to study on investor behavior. If they consented, they completed a baseline survey. They're entered a lottery to win financial assets. Um, and so on and so forth. This is what the initial allocation screen looks like. If your Hebrew is rusty, it, this is what it's telling them. Uh, basically, they just need to track how much the value of their asset was um, and how it changed in, in shekels. And we fixed the exchange rate to the initial just to simplify the process. Um, we had a number of um, sub-treatments. Some were divested after the election, some before the election, some were had $100 of stock, some had $50 of stock that they could um, trade. They could only trade 10% um, of their portfolios though, because we are inspired by Anatoly Chubias's reforms not to kind of give them the money and then have them divest the next day. We had them, we had them say, well, you can trade 
of your portfolio. And if you don't trade, you have, um, you can register a buy and hold decision. Just say, I don't want to change anything, but you have to register it and engage with us every week. And if you don't, then you lose the 10%. So there's an incentive for engagement. Um, and there was a kind of an incentive to, there was a limit on how much they could trade so that they were still kind of invested on the day of the election to some extent, though, except for these guys who were divested. Um, uh, I, I'm running out of time. I already talked about this. Um, it, we use sort of gamification principles. So this is what folks in the Valley, Silicon Valley use to kind of make games addictive and, and for behavioral design purposes, you know, to, to you know, help you kind of, but we, we, we thought that kind of, this would be helpful to get people engaged in, in our platform as well. Um, so you wanna give them a clear motivation. So they had a financial stake of between 50 or $100 and the ability to perform the task. So the, it was a simplified investment task, which they could do on our own platform and they could do it every week on the weekend when they had time. And we nudged them, we had a trigger. They nudged them to complete their next decision as they received feedback on the week before's uh, decision. Um, importantly, there, um, we, we actually set, gave them two separate sets of surveys. So once they consented to our study, um, they knew the financial study was coming from us, but they didn't. Know, we could also anonymously survey with them on their political attitudes and their attitudes towards the peace process. And so, um, the, you know, one 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 challenge that often researchers into peace find is social desirability bias. Um, we think by having different different um, totally different surveys, which are among many they're receiving from many alternative sources, we actually managed to solve this problem quite quite effectively. Now, I'll give you one. Um, one example of how we can verify this. So we actually asked them at the end of the study, um, what do you think the researchers can learn from this study? Now, you know, this being Israel, you know, it's a kind of fam country of, of famous for people being fairly forthright about what their views are. Um, a refreshing number of people said that we could learn nothing from our study, that it was a complete waste of our time. Um, but I think the modal response was that, um, you know, they thought we'd learn about economic knowledge, interest in markets, the risk attitudes, the capital market, and so on and so forth, which are all true because we studied this in our financial literacy paper. <laughs> and, um, it was interesting that even um, though this was a contentested election, um, and this was around, uh, these surveys were done at the time of the election, only seven respondents, if you can, can say they had any, our study had anything to do with election and politics. Uh, and, and of those six of the seven thought we were trying to understand the effects of, of, of political attitudes on financial behavior rather than on financial um, financial interaction on political um, attitudes. So, um, so if you construe one person's um, open, open response in a particular way, they seem to have got the causality in the way that we were interested in, but, but that's one person out of a sample of more than 1,345. So um, I, I'm running out of time. I'll just say, well, I already told, kind of summarized the result. This is what it looked like before the study. We, um, in 2013, this is what it looked like after in terms of the vote shares. You can see that there's a movement from people supporting right-wing parties to center parties and people voting for center parties to the left. And this is reflected in regressions. <laughs> um, it's regret reflected in their attitudes towards the peace process. It's not reflected in their attitudes towards economic policy questions. So you might think that people are voting for the left because they're pro more pro redistribution or something like that. We don't really move them on those types of questions except potentially on this question we asked um, should you know these are world values survey questions the government should be responsible for helping the poor versus the people should take care of themselves and so on this question you know um, people became a bit more actually right-wing if anything they said well maybe people should help themselves rather than the government be responsible but um, this is not significant in the index and really it's the peace questions that are driving the result um, I already kind of mentioned this, that kind of, it, it also seems to be a sociotropic thing. People are become more focused on Israel's benefits from peace rather than their own personal benefits in terms of um, in, in the treatment group. Um, in our, and then, you know, I've already talked about this. You know, they learned some stuff. They be, women became more financially confident in particular as uh, measured by their financial literacy score, self-assessed financial knowledge, risk tolerance, and stock market participation. This is what regression looks like. Um, this is what their financial literacy test looks like. I think this is worth mentioning that, you know, so we, we kind of reduced the gap between the people's self-assessed financial knowledge in the, this is post-treatment. So women, as you can see, um, even for the same level of objective financial knowledge, they tended to lag men in financial, in their sort of self-assessed financial knowledge. 
but we women who become in the treatment group uh, become closer to men um, and they become the slope increases so they as they, they become more aware that they know more and they become more confident men um, if any if, if anything become aware that they're not as 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 as, as knowledgeable <laughs> as as they were before so the people men who don't know so much become aware that they don't know so much and as, as the result is um, you know, there's a, some, there's a fin literature in finance, as you know, that men tend to trade too much. They tend to be a bit overconfident. It seems consistent with that. The, the men become a little less confident when they don't know much, and the women become know more, learn more, and they become more confident as well. Um, they also invest more, um, which you know, this, this says. Um, I also uh, already talked about this. They consult, they become less likely to consult other people and, and more likely to become self-reliant in their, in their financial decisions. Um, one last thing, we did this around the Brexit referendum as well, um, where we, instead we, the treat, treatment there was we gave them, um, these are likely UK voters, we assigned them 50 pounds worth of assets, um, some of them from the European Union, which are complementary with the UK economy, and some of them were um, UK stocks, which are complement, firms complement to the EU economy. So, you know, um, for an EU company that's complement to the UK, we chose, for example, Remy Contro, because Britain doesn't make cognac. Um, for a UK company complement to the EU economy, we, we chose, um, um, we chose uh, Diageo, which, you know, makes scotch, uh, you know, makes a whole bunch of other stuff too, but, you know, we, we kind of, we, we pointed out like the, the, the Bells and the Johnny Walker, just so people, um, kind of got, got that idea. Uh, we also exposed them to shorts of those positions we, um, and, and a fantasy treatment where they didn't get any money, they just got the interface, as well as exposure to um, US stocks in those same categories and, 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 and US baseball um, a derivative based on the chances that the uh, San Francisco Giants and New York Mets or the Red Sox would win the World Series based on their ELO scores, just to see whether, you know, just thinking about quantitative stuff might have the effects as well. Um, the main findings we found in that study was that, you know, you know, this is very different context than peace, obviously. It's about a referendum, about you know, being part of a political and economic union. Um, but being exposed to EU assets increased um, people's propensity to invest, uh, to support, remain in the referendum by around six percentage points. And, and this is true um, also for those people who got UK assets, which are complementary to the EU, but, um, but you know, uh, it, was, it wasn't as strong. Um, so I will also say that this kind of, you know, the, the, it reduces their incentives to vote leave, particularly if you've got UK assets. I'm going to skip this stuff and Just summarize the, the, the main takeaways from the book. So, so um, I think that some of the key ideas that sort of I think are coming out are that financial markets can provide a nonpartisan, arguably, an objective, albeit imperfect, metric for how individuals can assess the impact of policies on the economy. And this is a domain where we all may benefit, and one over which no political party has a franchise. I mean, in this country, you know what. Parties do try to kind of say, well, we're the party of the economy, but, you know, Bill Clinton said, the Demo you know, if the economy is stupid and, and claimed it for the Democrats, right now Trump is trying to claim it for the Republicans, but it's not one that and everyone, everyone, apart from the Pirate Party of Sweden, potentially, I think most part political parties tend to be pro-economy. Um, um, but, you know, there are different views on what to do with the economy, obviously. Um, designing incentive interventions to help citizens to learn by trading in the financial markets can empower them to make better financial decisions in their own lives, while also providing a useful nonpartisan gauge for how policies can affect the common good. And so, uh, I think all three benefits of well-designed financial market exposure, sharing common gains and exposure, sharing common metrics of what that is, you know, because I think that's something that in the era of fake news is very difficult. People trying to say, well, is this a good thing or not? You know, it's, it's often hard to tell. And, and an increased focus of attention on things which kind of bring us together, which, you know, we're, you know I think, which I think the economy does, um, can be put in ways to reduce political polarization and, and conflict. And I think that, you know, political economy problem solvers like Alexander Hamilton, Matsukata Masayoshi, and even Anatoly Chubayas, even though, of course, with mixed success, um, I think have been trying to solve these problems over centuries, but I think we can still learn from their successes as well as their mistakes in, in crafting better policies um, today.
and uh, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and your comments. Thanks very much, Saul. Uh, please, questions, comments? The floor is open for discussion. Um, do, do, you, um, do, do you mind running the, the, the questions, Leonid? <laughs> oh, right, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah, right, I, I, I invite questions. So please, you can use chat or you can speak up. Just unmute the mic and... Okay. Well, uh, well, people are still thinking. Let me. Can I can I go one? Can I go with one? Yeah, please. All right. Um, I assume if you give people money, they start <laughs> being more open and uh, you know uh, understanding to others' problems and you know generally more welcoming and whatever. So you gave people stocks. Do I understand correctly that being open and not as right leaning and whatever is going beyond their usual effect of being open because they now have more money? Yeah, so um, so we gave people between fifty and a hundred dollars of stock. So in the you know in the Israeli context, that's an you know equivalent to you know the daily uh, average daily wage. It's not a lot of money, um, right? Uh, so um, so it's not generally probably not enough to kind of get people to change their political views in, 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 in a big way, right? So when was also, the last time somebody gave you a hundred dollars? When was the last time someone gave me a hundred dollars? Yes. Um, if somebody gives me a hundred dollars right now, I'll be so open and happy and welcoming. I, I, I promise um, you, not, not because it's a very big share of my income. <laughs> yeah, so we, we cut it that. We, we, we looked at that fairly carefully in the, um, in the Econometrica paper by doing a number of things. Firstly, we, we checked whether the effects were bigger for people who are rich versus above and below median income, and it didn't seem to matter. It also didn't matter so much whether you got $50 or $100. Um, $100 was a bit stronger, but it wasn't significantly so. We also, um, we also, um, we also actually asked them a battery of questions on their subjective well-being. So maybe if they, you know, uh, which are kind of the, the questions that are in this um, famous AER article on, on subjective well-being. And we found that we didn't actually, you know, the, the, the dark side of our treatment is we didn't make them any happier. So they changed their attitudes towards the peace process, but they didn't become shiny, happy people who love peace because they're happy because they got $100. So it doesn't seem like it was that answer. Furthermore, the effects persist even a year after the study. So, you know, you, you, if you're expecting, you know, I, I don't know, if hundred dollars would you know keep you cheery, cheery for for a year, if it would, then I'm I'm gonna I, I'll, I'd, I'd be happy to wire you a hundred bucks right now. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll send you my bank account details later, but uh, I'm sure there is data. There yeah. is a published paper somewhere about you know people being happier because they got a hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. Dollars. I mean, those, and those if you contrast that to to your to other papers that, that yeah, I those tend to be a much larger sums than what we had, uh, and in uh, you know these tend to be like lottery winners who who kind of get you know and and the effects tend to um, they don't persist a, you know as as long as as a year after the study for um, we 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 found that people were following financial information, following financial news after the study, and their attitudes towards the peace process had changed even a year after the study, which I don't think is consistent with you know short term kind of stuff of that, that kind. Okay, anyone else please? Questions? Let's start with questions first and then we'll move on to comments. Mm -hmm. Are there any, is there anyone who uh, wants I, to? I have a who is that? Hello? Um, I have a question. Oh, please, so uh, identify yourself. Who is that? Oh, yeah. it's uh, Telman. Um, Juan. Okay, yeah, Juan, Juan. Telman. so please go ahead, yeah, right, sure. Yep, so basically I wanted to ask like um, mainly like uh, your research con connected with the increasing the financial literacy. So maybe can you describe some issues that happened when you tried to implement, you know, uh, your ways to increase the financial literacy, like how you conducted it and um, like maybe some struggles or mm -hmm. um, issues that happened on the way because, for example, in our economies, increasing the financial literacy is quite hard, especially mm -hmm. among the like uh, common people, because mm -hmm. we don't have much institutions. So, how you handled that situation? Yeah, no, that, that's actually it's, it's an incredibly important point. So, you know, in fact, you know, in in general, you know, field experiments. <coughs> on, well, firstly, you know, people have found that there's a strong 
correlation between being more financially literate and, and you know, being wealthier in your life over the life cycle. Um, but you know, getting the kind of changing financial literacy, as you point out, is actually very hard. Um, even by putting kind of adults, working age adults in a classroom and trying to teach them sort of compound interest and kind of, you know, asset diversification, it's, it's actually very challenging. And so you know, field experiments where we, they can really expensive field experiments where people go into a classroom and are, are taught these concepts actually don't seem to have very big results, a big effect. And, and this is true in rich and poor countries. Um, and, and so what we found, I think is particularly exciting is that we, you know, we, we didn't give them, a, you know, we gave them a small incentive, but it wasn't a lot. And, um, and it's sort of, it was done over the internet in their own time. And we just said, well, you know, we, we didn't t give them any financial information other than this is your stock. You know, here's a platform to trade it. Um, what did you, you know, we asked them, we did ask them every week, you know, what did your stock do? And, and uh, what did it do of the last week? What did it do over the last three years? And what were the major drivers of the value of your stock in your view? As well as um, what, what do you think it will do next week? Um, so we actually asked them to predict <laughs> the stock's um, um, performance. And so, Apart from that, we didn't give them any financial information. We didn't give them any education. We just said, you can research the stock on your own. Here's a link to the Hebrew version of investing.com or, or in the UK experiment, just the you know, English version. And, and people became financially literate on their own. So I think, you know, I, you know, I, I think many of you kind of teach adults and, and you know, I, I teach in a business school. And you know, it's, it's, as you know, it's much harder to teach um, adult stuff because they really need to see the value of what <laughs> what you're teaching them so at least it's hard for me to teach them <laughs> that but, you know you have to convince them that what they're, they're learning is, is valuable and, and give them and, and allow them to reach their own conclusions and we think that by giving the people this kind of this nudge and this opportunity to trade in financial markets in a simplified way you know i, I actually made things stick in a, in a way which is harder to do if you kind of stick them in the room and say Here's the kind of exponential formula for compound interest and, and things like that, right? So, um, so we think actually, uh, you know, even from an educational perspective, this is going to be a very effective way of getting working age adults to, to, to learn about important financial concepts. So we, we really, you know, I mean, one question we have is whether we can scale this up just on, on, on that basis alone and, and try to see whether we can make people um, kind of more financially literate at, at scale using this approach. Excellent. Thanks very yeah. much. Uh, anyone else, please? Uh, so, while well, we are waiting for other people to ask questions, uh, I'd like to respond to your invitation to discuss the Russian privatization yeah. in the perspective of your, uh, of your story. I think it's uh, very edifying. And, uh, and uh, I think a good way to start would be to make a reference to this paper by Baumol that inspired so many people, myself and Timur including. And that is that people apply their human capital for productive or non-productive purposes, depending on the institutional environment, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> what you argue is that in addition to institutions, or maybe instead of institutions, you can also affect people's choices between productive and unproductive behavior by giving them some uh, ownership, ownership stake, some assets to care about. So, and that they become less, uh, more reluctant to invest in country because they would develop their, their their assets. So there is some complementarity between asset ownership and application of human capital. Yeah. So this kind of a micro, that's an alternative to, uh, to Baumol. Uh, Baumol says institutions matter and you say asset ownership matter. But then Timur asked you about, <coughs> the, uh, uh, about the inequality in asset allocation. Mm -hmm. And that was really a crucial point in the Russian case because yeah. uh, people were given these vouchers uh, not for the purposes of creating a long-term state in the new institutional environment among these people, but uh, speaking uh, rudely, just to shut them up for the time being, so that they don't stay in the way of this grand scheme or grand mm -hmm. scam for that matter. And mm -hmm. I think this <clears throat> uh, this objective to basically shut people up, to, to remove those who can block this reform, it was spelled out quite explicitly. There was a book written by Andrew Schleifer and some of his yeah. Russian co-authors, so co-conspirators. Mm -hmm. Boyko Schleifer. Vishnu. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. When they, they made this point extremely explicit. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the inequality was tremendous. Now, that inequality at the beginning had a uh, strong impact on the institutional environment. 
because as some people argued, myself including, uh, inequality in asset ownership yeah. affected the incentives to have secure property rights. And the security of property rights has never been accomplished in Russia for, for decades to come, and that can be traced down to, to this inequality. So one big difference uh, between the Russian case and, say, the Israeli case is that in the case of Israel, we have well-developed uh, financial markets and asset ownership was secure. So uh, people have assets and, you know, they, they, began, they begin uh, uh, really uh, 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 collecting returns to these assets in the Russian case because there was nowhere to invest these assets. Uh, this voucher that people received, uh, peanuts uh, were squandered or bought up by some unscrupulous people to even further increase this inequality of ownership. So all I'm saying is that uh, your micro story, give people uh, assets to own, does not really uh, present an alternative to the institutional story, but in fact, it might even reinforce this story. So uh, in addition to giving people asset ownership, one has to take care of, of an institutional environment where they can earn significant returns to their assets. And uh, how, how on earth to come up with that environment is really a very big question. And in Russia, it didn't happen. So that's my five cents. Yeah. So, so I, I, so, so I think. I mean, I think this is really crucial and important. And I think it's, a, it's something that, you know, I, I've got, I've received pushback on from a number of sources. Well, you know, yeah, you know, particularly when you look about the, you know, think about America, you know, the United States, or Britain. You know, these are, you know, even in the 17th century, people might argue the 17th century Britain had very strong. Uh, domestic property rights, right? So, um, others uh, others argue that actually no, and the domestic property rights were emerged in this period. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, well, um, so so in my um, QJE article, I, I kind of look at, at at the pattern of the constitution as well as the um, expropriation type of information, and, and you know, drawing on other sources. And it seems like it is true that domestic property rights are fairly secure in England in the 17th century, but um, Overseas property rights are not, and the overseas stock market, the stock companies basically give people an incentive to protect overseas property, uh, by and, and thus give them an alignment of interest towards kind of seizing the control over those uh, that that right from from the government or, or from the king in this. Way. Now, I think what's also so what's also I think interesting is I don't think Japan had you know in the seventeen eight sorry in the nineteenth century had secure you know, domestic property rights either, right? So, um, and, and so what I, I think it, it's not a necessary condition. I think oftentimes when people think about uh, well-functioning financial systems, they do kind of think, well, you need property rights in order for this to be the case. And I think, but, but I like your framing of it. There's really, these are compliments. They're not necessary. And in fact, they reinforce each other. In, in, in the Japanese case, I think um, it's, it, it, it seems, it seems pretty clear to me, at least, and I need to kind of get more evidence, <laughs> obviously, that you know the property rights were not secure in the 19th century, and and in fact the samurai, you know, it was it was a situation where kind of violence was going to determine who gets what, um, um, in, in in a big way, and 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 sort of control over who who has control over that violence. So, but, but what was possible is using finance to kind of give people a credible gain from peace in a way, even in an environment where the people who are most likely to be violent can then see, well, you know, it's better for me to be peaceful because I'm going to, you know, <laughs> we can grow this pie and we can grow this economy. And, 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 and it's in the government's interest to keep me peaceful. And so, the, you know, basically this new technology changes the incentives of people and, and thus creates a possibility for re creating property rights protections where it wasn't necessarily the case before. So I do believe in that context that, um, and I think more generally, that it doesn't have to be the case that you need to have property rights and then have finance um, operating on the back of it. Of course, it helps a lot, but it's not essential. And so um, so I think what is, what is essential is the credibility, right? So you can have credibility emerging through kind of well-ordered um, institutions, but you can also have it through sort of direct incentive. So one idea we had was, well, supposing you want to in intervene in a, de in a developing country, which has insecure property rights, well, you could use the you know, you could use your own credibility, you know, the fact that, you know, you're from a kind of a university where you kind of, you, you, you sign these, you know, these, you, you, you're inviting them to an experiment where they, they, we promise them that they will get certain things, 
you know, that, that might be enough, um, even in an environment where they themselves, you know, if they're operating through the banking system, might not be able to kind of act, um, benefit from those things. So you can sort of, that, that um, so it doesn't, I don't think it has to be the case that, um, you know, you can only do this in places like Israel or somewhere like this. I think we could do this in, 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 in many under institutionalized environments using kind of imported credibility in some ways or, or, or um, ideally kind of at the macro level doing it in such a way that the people who are elites like in Japan have the incentives to create, you know, their own have a credible alignment of incentives themselves. Uh, does that make sense? Because I think this is really a crucial um, I, I think it does. <clears throat> a very quick remark is that uh, mm -hmm. an important difference between Japan of the Meiji time and Russia in the 1990s was that Japan didn't have an oligarchy. And this class of the samurai was really a very numerous group. So it was quite difficult for them, I guess, to collude and to form a force that would capture the institution. So uh, power and influence in Japan was much more widespread. And Russia had a couple of dozen of people that were pretty much in control of everything and they shaped and uh, molded the institutions to their preferences, which was not to the, to the preference of the nation. But, but I'm afraid we're running out of time and I want to, to see if uh, that, that's a, a very interesting discussion. I'd love to continue, but- I have one. Uh, of, of course we can uh, communicate with uh, someone privately after the talk. His yeah, email please is, do. Um... Right. Sorry, let me but, do that. Yeah, but, yeah, but in the meantime, Timur <laughs> has a question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Timur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, <clears throat> as far as I understand, the main mechanism in your Israel study is that people begin to internalize uh, the costs of conflict, right? The potential costs of conflict. So, uh, so my question, is there any evidence that, that these costs might differ much across people across individuals very, very much probably so is there any evidence for this mechanism like besides the questions you asked maybe uh, maybe there are no location matters but you you mentioned in the beginning that uh the cost of conflict is different uh, in different locations of israel so probably for people who lived near the conflict zone uh this mechanism was more salient than in other areas yeah, so we, um, you know, we did a bunch of heterogeneous, you know, we, we, you know, we looked at subgroups and heterogeneous treatment effects and things like that. Um, and it was interesting that, well, firstly, yeah, the effect is stronger for people. It, it is kind of, there is an effect across the board, but there's, uh, there's a weaker effect in the, in the West Bank, right? So settlers who are kind of, <laughs> are, are, were, were, weren't, didn't change their voting decision quite so much. Um, uh, it was, but it was stronger kind of in the north of Israel, the south of Israel, the center of Israel. Um, also, interestingly enough, the kind of, by religion, of course, religious identity is really important in Israel. Um, the ultra-Orthodox, um, you know, they, they vote, tend to vote on other issues related to kind of, uh, but but even even among the ultra-Orthodox, we, we actually changed the attitudes for the peace process in terms of not so much as making them pro, you know, concession, but making them less anti-concession. <laughs> you know, so it's a, so, you know, so even, even um, uh, on those margins, there seemed to be a change, it, you know, of course, it, from a different, different baselines, right? So, um, so that we found quite, quite interesting given, and um, uh, I, I also didn't mention that, you know, we, 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 all, we get some people, Palestinian assets and Israeli assets, and it turned out that it, you know, they learned, the effects were quite similar, um, which was not our prior. We thought that, you know, it could, we could go either way because, you know, one thing is that the Palestinian assets are much more connected with the, with the conflict and, and with the returns from the conflict. They are also more novel, so there might be more learning. Um, but Israeli assets were more familiar and familiarity breeds investment and there, people were more engaged with Israeli assets. And so um, also there's a price performance difference. So the Israeli assets performed well and the Palestinian assets did not, that we couldn't ex ante know that. So controlling for the price performance difference, actually the Palestinian assets were stronger, but it wasn't significantly so. And so um, this kind of made us, you know, so I, actually I think this is kind of reassuring because it, it would be hard, I think it's politically much harder to give people sort of assets from the other side, so to speak, but, but even giving them Israeli assets had the same effect on kind of making them pro-peace. Pro and, and pro um, uh, in post peace initiatives and vote in particular ways. And I think 
Um, wh one last thing is that um, in in all of these cases, the the people who are already invested, you know, who would this is a correlational observation. People who are already investing in the stock market in, in our study, we stratified on that. So that, you know, so we, so that it's by, by construction orthogonal to treatment, but they, we, we don't tend to change their attitudes very much. They were, they were already supportive of the peace process and, and, and voting in those dimensions, in those directions. But it's the novices that seem to be kind of moving more. And so the people who are inexperienced seem to be learning. And this, I think, is consistent with a long-term learning effect rather than, you know, people you know, just some kind of short-term thing. The people who kind of became experimentally assigned um, to stock markets in a way that they hadn't been before became more like the people who were already doing it in their behaviors and, and, and attitudes. And so, um, you know, similarly in England, I think, you know, it was in, the, in, in my QJE study, I looked at non-merchants who were able to trade or invest overseas at the first time. They became more like the merchants in their political views and attitudes, partly through the stock market. And so, um, so I think it's sort of, again, this sort of alignment of interest and the alignment of understanding effect that seems to be important. Well, thanks very much, uh, uh, Can I have uh, a question? Uh, the final one, because we are running out of time. So please make it quick. Okay, so uh, question is that, uh, what would happen, for example, if uh, like uh, left-wing Israelis would be given uh, stocks of uh, companies that uh, don't benefit from uh, peace, uh, like agreement, like for example, uh, like military companies or something like this. Uh, so would this, uh, because we know that there is a lot of um, cognitive political biases uh, in stock market behavior and uh, essentially people tend to pick stocks uh, that better align with their political views. Uh, so in fact, this may be quite like dark side of uh, the mechanism uh, you propose. Yeah, so, um, you know, so the, there is a major, well, the Tel Aviv 25 index, uh, there was one defense company in there, it's Elbit Systems, but that's only like 3% of the index. Um, we, we actually, um, we didn't, um, we didn't, we, we chose stocks by design, which were kind of, or thought, you know, were, weren't strongly related either to the peace process or not. Otherwise, they were kind of bricks and mortars, commercial banks and telecoms companies. Um, but but we uh, but we did think about this, and that's one reason why we um, in the British study we actually gave people shorts of the positions um, as well as long. So they were going to benefit when the uh, UK stock market went down rather <laughs> than when it went up. And and it turned out it didn't matter. The people who got the shorts of the positions, you know, were changed their attitudes in the same direction as the people who got the long positions. And this is partly because we didn't give them a lot of money. We gave them fifty pounds or fifty dollars. You know, it's not like, you know, maybe if you gave them $100,000 of Elbit stock, they would become, you know, you know, more focused on that. But it was really, I mean, we think in our study, it was really about learning. So, you know, they learned about the gains to the British economy from being in the European Union. Um, and that was, you know, it wasn't their kind of personal 50 bucks <laughs> that, uh, that, that made their decision for them. So, so I think you're right. And, um, you know, there's going to be some point where personal incentives are going to matter more. Uh, and and people and uh, um, but I think that's a, again where the index is valuable, right? So the economy, the index gives us a kind of a, 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 like a, a circumscribed but general view of the common good in a way that individual stocks might not. And and so so I think if we're going to design these things, we want to do it focused on on the common good and the index rather than than maybe less so on on specific companies which have these features that you mentioned. Um, but but it's, it's, it's a good point. Very good, thanks. I, I'm still learning whether it's possible to give you a round of applause, of applause <laughs> on Skype, on Zoom. Uh, don't know how to do it, but feel free to indicate your emotions by using all sorts of emojis in the chat column. Uh, so we are very grateful for your, uh, to you for your presentations. Great yeah, paper. Thank you so much. It's been a fun We'll, 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 we'll be looking and, forward uh, to, staying in, to staying in touch oh, with you. Please, this is, of, uh, notes and <laughs> this is extremely institutional, so I think it was a good pick for our seminar. Before we adjourn, can I ask Bernard to please remind us what is going to be happening next? Um, yes, well, uh, thank you, Leonid. Uh, so next week we have uh, our uh, new postdoc, uh, Gayan Bardandian. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And she will be presenting her paper, Return Migration Decisions, Evidence from Irish Mass Migration at the Turn of the 20th Century.
So please, okay. at uh, 10 minutes past six, as usual, uh, you are all welcome to join us. And well, thank you once more, uh, Samitra, for uh, your wonderful presentation. It was uh, great to, to have you presenting for us. Terrific. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks very again. much, everyone. Be safe.